Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, and everyone who has joined us today in the pursuit of personal and professional development, I warmly welcome you. As we gather here, we find ourselves united by a common thread, a thread that weaves through the tapestry of our lives, coloring our experiences and shaping our destinies. This thread, often seen as a challenge, is the experience of pain. I want you to think back to a time in your life when you faced a challenge so daunting, a hurdle so high that it seemed insurmountable. Recall the sensation, the feeling that this was a mountain too steep to climb. Yet here you are today, a testament to the human spirit's resilience and ability to conquer adversity. It's essential to recognize that pain, in its many forms, is an inevitable part of our journey. But more importantly, it is temporary. Imagine pain as a traveler passing through the seasons of your life. It arrives sometimes unannounced, often unwelcome, and it sets up camp. During its stay, it tests us, pushes us, and demands more from us than we ever thought possible. But like all travelers, it moves on, leaving behind a trail of lessons, strength, and often an unrecognizable version of ourselves, stronger and more resilient than before. Now I'm not here to tell you that pain is easy, nor am I here to diminish the struggles that each of us faces. But in my years of experience interacting with people from all walks of life, from the young entrepreneur brimming with ideas, to the seasoned professional standing at a crossroads, I've seen a universal truth. This truth is that pain, no matter how severe, how deep, or how long-lasting it appears, is a temporary state. It is not a permanent residence, but rather a stop on our journey to greater heights. Pain can often feel like a relentless storm, battering the shores of our resolve, threatening to flood the foundations of our hopes and dreams. But remember, even the fiercest storm eventually runs out of rain. And in its wake, it leaves a landscape that has often changed, yes, but also ripe for new growth, new possibilities, and new beginnings. I want you to hold on to this thought. Pain is temporary. It may not feel like it in the moment. It may seem as though the night will never end. But the dawn always breaks. The sun always rises, bringing with it light, warmth, and the promise of a new day. The lessons pain teaches us. Let's use these experiences as stepping stones to build a path to a future where we are not defined by our pain, but rather by how we overcame it, how we use it to fuel our journey to success. In the words that follow, I will take you through the landscape of pain, its nature, its lessons, and most importantly, how we can transform it from a foe into an ally. Together, let us venture in understanding pain, not as an enemy, but as an integral, albeit challenging part of our growth and development. Remember, in the grand narrative of your life, pain is but a chapter, not the entire story. What lies ahead as we turn this page and step into the realm of understanding pain in the context of our growth? We embark on an exploration that is both profound and transformative. It's crucial to acknowledge that growth in its true essence is not a journey marred by unbroken strides of success and ease. Rather, it is punctuated with trials, tribulations, and yes, pain. You see, the concept of growth intertwined with pain is not just a philosophical musing. It is deeply rooted in the very fabric of our existence. Think about the process of physical growth. It's often accompanied by growing pains. Similarly, our personal and professional growth is not devoid of discomfort. Pain, in its various forms, whether emotional, physical, or psychological, acts as a catalyst that propels us forward facilitating growth in ways comfort never could. Consider the story of a butterfly emerging from its chrysalis. The struggle to break free is not an easy one. It's a fight that requires strength, endurance, and resilience. However, it's through this struggle that the butterfly gains the strength in its wings to fly. Without this painful process, the butterfly would never soar. Similarly, in our lives, the struggles we face, the pain we endure, build our strength, character, and resilience. They equip us with the wings to soar higher in our personal and professional endeavors. The lives of those who have faced adversity and emerged stronger are rich with examples. History is replete with individuals who have used their pain as a stepping stone to greatness. Think of the greatest inventors, leaders, and visionaries. Their paths were never smooth. They faced rejection, failure, and heartbreak. Yet they didn't allow their pain to be a roadblock. Instead, they used it as a stepping stone to achieve greatness. Their pain wasn't a stopping point, it was a starting point for growth and transformation. 
Take the story of a young girl who faced rejection from multiple publishers for her manuscript. Each rejection was a sting, a moment of pain and doubt. But she persisted, believing in her story and her potential. Today, J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series is a global phenomenon. It wasn't just her talent that led to her success. It was her ability to persevere through the pain of rejection and criticism. Now bring this closer to our own lives. Each one of us here has faced our own set of challenges and pains. Perhaps it was a business venture that didn't take off, a career path that hit a dead end, or a personal loss that left us reeling. In those moments of pain, we are presented with two choices, to succumb or to overcome. To succumb is to allow the pain to define and diminish us. To overcome is to use the pain as a tool for growth, learning from it, and allowing it to strengthen us. This process of growing through pain is not about dismissing or belittling our struggles. It's about acknowledging them, learning from them, and then moving past them. It's about changing our narrative from, why is this happening to me, to what can I learn from this? This shift in perspective is where growth begins. Growth through pain is also about resilience. Resilience is not a trait that we are born with. It's a muscle that we build each time we face a challenge and choose to stand up, dust ourselves off, and move forward. We strengthen this muscle the more we exercise it, the stronger it becomes. And with a strong resilience muscle, we are better equipped to handle future challenges and pains. Moreover, it's essential to understand that pain is not just a teacher, it's also a guide. It often points us in directions we would never have considered. Many times the path we are on is comfortable, familiar, not necessarily where we are meant to be. Pain nudges us out of complacency, forcing us to explore new avenues and opportunities. It pushes us out of our comfort zones, where real growth happens. And so, as we reflect on the role of pain in our growth, let's remember that it's not the pain that defines us, but how we respond to it. It's our response to pain that shapes our character, owns our strengths, and builds our legacy. When we look back on our lives, it won't be the moments of ease and comfort that stand out. It will be the times we faced pain head-on, wrestled with it, and emerged victorious. These are the moments that define our journey and our growth. The challenges and the pains that come our way view them not as barriers, but as bridges to a stronger, more resilient, and more successful self. And as we do so, let's carry with us the unshakable belief that pain is temporary, but the growth and strength we gain from it are everlasting. Venture deeper into understanding the nature of temporary pain. This exploration is not just about recognizing pain as a transient phase, but also about learning how to distinguish between temporary discomfort and long-term suffering, and how to navigate through these waters with grace and fortitude. When we talk about the nature of temporary pain, we're discussing the inherent transience of life's challenges. It's about the understanding that life's most difficult moments no matter how intense, are not permanent fixtures in our journey. This realization is liberating. It allows us to face adversity with a different mindset, one that acknowledges the pain, but also sees beyond it to the potential for growth and renewal. To grasp this concept, consider the analogy of a sculptor chiseling a block of marble. Each strike of the chisel, no doubt, is a shock to the stone, a moment of impact that changes its shape forever. The marble, if it could feel each strike, might experience a moment of pain. But this pain is temporary. With each strike, the sculptor is shaping something beautiful, something lasting. In our lives, we are both the marble and the sculptor. The pains we experience are the strikes that shape us, and with each strike, we have the opportunity to create something more refined, more defined, and more representative of who we are meant to be. Now let's turn our focus to differentiating temporary pain from enduring struggles. Temporary pain is like the weather. It changes, it moves, and it eventually passes. It could be the pain of failure, the sting of rejection, or the discomfort of stepping out of our comfort zone. These pains are acute, they hurt intensely, but they are not permanent stakes. They are the pains that, when endured and understood, lead to personal growth, new opportunities, and increased resilience. Enduring struggles, on the other hand, are different. They are more like a climate, a long-term state that can define our environment. These are deeper issues that may require a different approach, often involving long-term strategies, external help, or significant life changes. 
The key here is recognizing which type of pain we are dealing with so we can respond appropriately. Take a moment to consider the temporary nature of most challenges. Think back to a time when you faced a difficult situation. Perhaps at the moment it felt all-consuming, as if the pain would never end. But it did. Over time the intensity lessened, the situation changed, and you moved forward. This is the nature of most pains we encounter. They are temporary. But what makes temporary pain so significant? It is significant because it is during these phases of discomfort that we often make the most meaningful changes in our lives. It's when we're uncomfortable that we're most likely to take action, to make a change, to grow. Comfort doesn't motivate us in the same way. Comfort doesn't push us to reach new heights, and pain does. This understanding leads us to a critical realization. The way we react to pain is more important than the pain itself. Our reaction, our attitude toward these temporary challenges, is what ultimately determines their impact on our lives. Do we see pain as a setback, a roadblock, or do we see it as a teacher, a guide, a catalyst for growth? The choice is ours. Furthermore, embracing the temporary nature of pain empowers us to endure it more gracefully. It's the knowledge that this too shall pass that gives us the strength to persevere. It's the understanding that every painful experience is an opportunity to learn something new about ourselves, to build resilience, and to develop coping strategies that will serve us in the future. So, as we navigate through our respective journeys, remind ourselves of the impermanent nature of pain. Let's approach each challenge with a mindset that this is not a permanent state, but a moment in time, that will pass. Use these moments not as reasons to despair, but as opportunities to learn, grow, and prepare ourselves for whatever lies ahead. Moving forward, the concept of resilience building through adversity is important to acknowledge. This is more than just a topic. It's a crucial life skill. It's about turning temporary pains and challenges we face into stepping stones for personal growth and inner strength. Just like a muscle that becomes stronger with exercise, our resilience intensifies each time we confront and overcome difficulties. The journey of building resilience is akin to sailing a ship through stormy seas. These storms of life, though daunting, teach us how to navigate, how to steady our ship, and how to emerge stronger with the knowledge and experience that equip us for future voyages. It's in the heart of these storms that we discover our true potential and resilience. Resilience is not something we're born with. It's forged in the fire of adversity. It's developed in those moments when we're faced with a challenge so overwhelming that giving up seems the easiest option, yet we choose to persevere. Every time we overcome an obstacle, every time we find a way to move forward despite the setbacks, we're building our resilience. This process is not about avoiding pain or adversity, but about facing them head-on and using them as opportunities to become stronger and more capable. Take the example of a business leader facing a financial crisis. The situation seems bleak, the future uncertain. Yet, it's through navigating these choppy financial waters, making tough decisions, and learning from each miss. Step that this leader builds resilience. The crisis becomes a crucible, transforming their approach to business and leadership. Similarly, in our personal lives, we encounter situations that test our emotional and mental fortitude. It might be the loss of a loved one, a personal failure, or a health challenge. Each of these experiences, while painful, carries within it the seeds of growth and resilience. As we work through our grief, learn from our failures, or adapt to new limitations, we're building a reservoir of strength that will help us in future challenges. Moreover, building resilience is also about developing a mindset that views challenges as opportunities. It's about adopting a perspective that sees beyond the immediate pain and focuses on the potential for growth. This mindset shift doesn't happen overnight. It requires practice, patience, and persistence. It's about training yourself to ask, what can I learn from this, instead of, why is this happening to me? This learning-oriented approach transforms the way we deal with adversity. Instead of being knocked down by challenges, we begin to see them as learning experiences. Each obstacle teaches us something new about ourselves, about others, about life. These lessons are invaluable. They cannot be taught in a classroom or read in a book. They are learned in the trenches of life, where resilience is built. One effective way to build resilience is through reflection and introspection. After facing a challenge, take the time to reflect on what happened. 
What did you learn? How did you grow? What strengths did you discover in yourself? This process of reflection turns experience into wisdom, pain into strength. Another key aspect of building resilience is the support system we create around ourselves. Just as a tree relies on a network of roots to stand tall and withstand storms, we need a strong support system to help us through tough times. The support can come from family, friends, mentors, or even professional counselors. These individuals provide us with different perspectives, advice, and the emotional support we need to persevere. Furthermore, building resilience also involves taking care of ourselves physically, mentally, and emotionally. Just like a warrior prepares for battle, we need to prepare ourselves for life's challenges. This preparation involves regular exercise, a healthy diet, adequate sleep, and practices that support our mental health, such as meditation or journaling. By taking care of ourselves, we ensure that we're in the best possible shape to face whatever comes our way. The challenges we encounter with a spirit of resilience. Let's view each difficulty as a chance to grow stronger, wiser, and more capable. The process of building resilience is ongoing. It doesn't stop after one challenge or one victory. It's a lifelong journey, one that makes us more adaptable, more robust, and more prepared for the future. As we journey further, embracing the resilience we built through overcoming adversity, we arrive at a profound realization. Pain, in its raw and unvarnished form, can be a powerful catalyst for change. It's a force that, while initially may bring discomfort and unease, ultimately has the power to transform, to push us into realms of growth and innovation that comfort and routine never could. Consider the essence of change. Change is often born from a place of discomfort, a place where staying the same becomes more painful than the risk involved in changing. Pain in this context is not just a challenge to be endured. It becomes a driving force compelling us to seek new horizons, to rethink our strategies, and to reevaluate our goals. It is in these moments of acute discomfort that we often find the impetus to make the most significant changes in our lives. Picture the entrepreneur who faces a failing business. Each day brings mounting debts, dwindling customers, and the looming threat of bankruptcy. It's an oil-consuming pain, one that threatens to overwhelm. Yet it's this very pain that drives the entrepreneur to innovate, to pivot, to find a new way to save their business. Without this pain, the comfort of the status quo might have led to stagnation. With it, there's a push towards reinvention and ultimately, success. Similarly, in our personal lives, pain can be the trigger for transformative change. Consider the individual who faces a health scare. This moment of pain and fear becomes a turning point, leading to a complete overhaul in lifestyle, diet and exercise. What was once an unassailable routine of unhealthy habits gives way to a renewed focus on health and well-being. Pain, therefore, becomes a catalyst for a positive, life-altering transformation. It's important to recognize that while pain initiates the process of change, it is our response to this pain that determines the outcome. It's about channeling the energy of our discomfort into positive action. This requires a mindset shift, a willingness to step out of our comfort zones and embrace new possibilities. It's about seeing beyond the immediate discomfort and focusing on the potential for something better on the other side. Change spurred by pain is not about a blind leap into the unknown. It's a thoughtful, deliberate process of exploring new options, learning new skills, and opening ourselves up to new experiences. It's about taking the lessons learned from our painful experiences and using them to build a better, stronger, and more fulfilling future. Also, consider the role of resilience in this process. The resilience we've built through our past experiences of adversity becomes a critical asset when navigating change. It gives us the strength to endure the uncertainties and challenges that come with any significant change. It provides a foundation of inner strength that we can rely on when things get tough. Moreover, pain as a catalyst for change doesn't just apply to individuals, it applies to societies and organizations as well. History is filled with examples of societal pain leading to significant reforms and advancements. It's often in the aftermath of crisis and conflict that we see the most profound societal changes, whether it's in the form of new laws, new movements, or new ways of thinking. View the pains and challenges we encounter not as obstacles but as opportunities. Opportunities to reassess, to reinvent, and to rejuvenate. Approach change not with fear and apprehension, but with excitement and optimism for what lies ahead.
Navigating through painful experiences is like steering a ship through a treacherous storm. It's about understanding the nature of the storm, preparing for it, and knowing that eventually calm waters will appear on the horizon. Just as a seasoned sailor learns to read the winds and waves, we too can learn to navigate through the turbulent waters of pain and emerge stronger and wiser. First, acknowledge a simple truth. Pain in its various forms is an inevitable part of our lives. It's a universal experience, one that touches every life at some point. But while pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. It's not the pain itself that causes the most distress. It's how we perceive and respond to it. Our mindset, our approach to these experiences, can make all the difference. One of the first steps in navigating through painful experiences is acceptance. Acceptance does not mean resignation or giving up. Rather, it's about acknowledging reality as it is, not as we wish it to be. It's understanding that some things are beyond our control. This acceptance allows us to stop fighting against the inevitable and start focusing on what we can do. It opens up a space for us to deal with our situation more constructively. Next comes the phase of understanding. This involves taking a step back and looking at the situation objectively. Ask yourself, what can I learn from this? How can this experience help me grow? Every challenge carries a lesson. It's through understanding these lessons that we find meaning in our pain, and this meaning helps us to bear the burden more easily. Another vital aspect of navigating through pain is self-care. Often, in the midst of dealing with painful experiences, we neglect our own needs. However, taking care of our physical, emotional, and mental well-being is crucial during these times. Engaging in activities that nourish and rejuvenate us, such as exercise, meditation, or spending time in nature, can provide the strength and resilience needed to deal with our challenges. But it's also important to seek support when navigating through pain. Just as a ship in a storm may send out a distress signal, we too can reach out for help. This support can come in many forms, a trusted friend, a family member, a professional counselor. Daring our burden can lighten it, and the perspectives and guidance of others can provide invaluable assistance in finding our way. Through developing a problem-solving mindset, we can navigate through pain more effectively. Instead of dwelling on the problem, focus on finding solutions. Break down the situation into manageable parts and tackle each part systematically. This proactive approach empowers us to take control where we can and leads to a sense of accomplishment and progress. Patience plays a critical role in this journey as well. The path through pain is rarely linear. There will be setbacks and detours. It's important to be patient with ourselves in the process. Healing and growth take time, and rushing through or forcing outcomes can lead to frustration and exhaustion. An often overlooked but powerful tool in navigating through pain is gratitude. Even in the darkest of times, there are things to be grateful for. Focusing on these can shift our perspective, provide a sense of peace and hope, and remind us of the good that still exists in our lives. Maintaining a sense of hope is essential. Hope acts like a beacon guiding us through the darkness. It's the belief that things can and will get better. This hope is not based on wishful thinking, but on the understanding that pain is temporary, and that we have the strength and resources to get through it. Understanding that navigating through pain is not merely an act of endurance but also an opportunity for profound growth. We arrive at an enlightening realization. This realization is that there is indeed a bright side of pain. It might seem counterintuitive to associate pain with anything positive, yet it is in the crucible of our challenges and discomforts that some of those valuable life lessons are forged. Imagine for a moment a gardener in the early stages of spring. The soil is being turned, seeds are being planted, and the entire scene is one of upheaval and transformation. To the untrained eye, it might look chaotic, even destructive. But we know that this process, as arduous as it seems, leads to a bloom of vibrant flowers and lush greenery. Similarly, the pains and trials we endure are like the turning of the soil in our lives. They unsettle us, yes, but they also prepare us for growth, for blooming into our fullest potential. One of the brightest sides of pain is the development of empathy and compassion. When we experience pain, we gain a deeper understanding of what it means to struggle, to feel lost, or to face adversity. This understanding fosters a profound sense of empathy towards others going through similar experiences. It breaks down the walls of isolation and ego, reminding us of our shared human experience. Furthermore, pain often brings clarity and perspective. 
In the midst of our busiest days, it's easy to lose sight of what truly matters. Pain has a way of cutting through the noise, bringing into sharp focus the things that are genuinely important. It reminds us of the value of health, the importance of relationships, and the preciousness of time. This clarity can lead to a re-evaluation of priorities, often steering us towards a more fulfilling path. Another bright side of pain is the strength and resilience that it builds within us. Like a tree that withstands storm after storm, our roots grow deeper, our trunks sturdier, and under our branches more robust. We emerge from painful experiences not weakened but stronger, more resilient, and more adaptable. This strength is not just for ourselves, it becomes a source of support and inspiration for others. Pain also has the potential to be a powerful motivator for change and innovation. Throughout history, some of the greatest advancements and achievements have been born from a place of discomfort or dissatisfaction. Pain pushes us to challenge the status quo, to question, to innovate, and to find better ways of doing things. In essence, the bright side of pain lies in its transformative power. It is a teacher like no other, imparting lessons of empathy, clarity, strength, and motivation. It reshapes our lives not by diminishing us, but by expanding our horizons, deepening our understanding, and enriching our connections. It becomes clear that our journey through understanding pain is not just an intellectual exercise. Rather, it's a call to action, a beckoning to apply these insights to our everyday lives. The knowledge we've gained about pain, its temporary nature, and its role as a catalyst for growth and change set the stage for a transformative path ahead. Consider this moment as a starting point a springboard into a future where we are no longer at the mercy of our pains and challenges, but are masters of them. It's a future where each of us, armed with resilience, understanding, and a proactive mindset, can turn the tides of our personal and professional lives for the better. The first step in this transformative journey is to adopt a mindset of empowerment. Instead of viewing pain as a formidable enemy, see it as a challenge to be met with courage, intelligence, and strategy. It's about shifting our perspective from a passive, why is this happening to me, to an active, what can I do about, this? This change in mindset is the key that unlocks the potential within each painful experience to be a source of growth and learning. Commit to being architects of our own destiny. We've seen how pain can be a catalyst for change, driving us to reevaluate, adapt, and innovate. Awareness is power. When faced with challenges, let's ask ourselves, how can this situation spur me to grow? What new paths can I explore? What changes can I implement? This is not about finding immediate solutions. It's about setting a direction for continuous growth and improvement. The importance of resilience cannot be overstated. This resilience isn't a trait that some are born with and others are not. It's a skill that we can all develop. It's forged in the fires of adversity, strengthened with each challenge we overcome. Each of us has an inner strength far greater than we often realize. Let's pledge to nurture and build this resilience, knowing that it will be our most trusted companion in times of trial. Recognize the power of connection and empathy. Our shared experiences of pain bind us in a common human story. By reaching out, sharing our stories, and supporting each other, we not only lighten our own burdens, but also help others on their journey. Be there for one another, offering a listening ear, a word of encouragement, or a helping hand. Step forward with a spirit of optimism and hope. Pain, no matter how intense or daunting, is temporary. Beyond every night is the promise of a new dawn. Let's hold on to this hope as we navigate through life's challenges. Let's remember that every experience, especially the painful ones, is an opportunity for growth, learning, and ultimate success. As we conclude, I invite you to embrace this call to action. Let's take the insights and lessons we've gathered and apply them to our lives with determination and enthusiasm. Remember, in the symphony of your life, you are the composer. Each challenge, each pain, is a note that contributes to the beauty of the melody. Let's compose a masterpiece of resilience, growth, and success. The path ahead is ours to walk, and though filled with challenges, it is replete with opportunities for greatness. Let's begin that journey today. But what I teach is the importance of goal setting, setting very clear goals, making plans to achieve the goals, and then working on those goals each day. Because when you are working toward a goal, your self-confidence goes up, your energy goes up, 
and you actually become more intelligent. So, this feeling of forward movement is one of the most important success secrets in the world. Successful people are always moving towards something important to them, and the feeling of movement makes them happy. It releases endorphins in your brain which cause you to be more creative, more positive, stronger, and more powerful. Hello. Did you know that only 3% of adults have clear, written, measurable, time-bound goals and plans to achieve them? And by every statistic, these 3% accomplish 10 times as much as people with no goals at all. And why is it then that most people have no goals? If you earn 10 times as much with goals, if you have 10 times as much success with goals, why don't people all have goals? Well, there are five myths about setting goals and objectives that might help you rethink your decisions about not setting goals for yourself. First myth is, I already have goals, I don't need to set any. People who say this also say that their goals are, I want to be rich, and I want to be thin, and I want to be happy, and successful, and popular, and live my dreams. But these are not goals, these are wishes and fantasies common to all mankind. Crazy people and homeless people have these as goals. They're not goals, they're just fantasies, sometimes they're just delusions. A goal on the other hand, is like a beautiful home. Carefully designed, and upgraded continually, improved regularly, and worked on constantly. If it's not in writing, it's merely a dream or a wish. And we say that a goal that is not in writing is a wish with no energy behind it. It has no power in your life. It's just a vague objective that comes in and out of your life, sort of like a sunrise and a sunset, without ever accomplishing anything. Now the second most common myth that people don't set goals is, I don't need goals, I'm doing fine. Living your life without goals and objectives is like setting off across an unknown country with no road signs and no road map. But you have no choice then but to make it up as you go along, reacting and responding to whatever happens all day, all week, all month, and then just hoping for the best. If you are doing well today without written goals and plans, wow. It means you could probably be doing many times better in the future if you had clear targets to aim at and the ability to measure your progress as you go along. It's vital to have goals in every part of your life. Myth number three about goal setting is, I don't need written goals, I have them all in my mind. Now, the average stream of consciousness includes about 1,500 thoughts or words a minute, racing through your mind like a river. If your goals are only in your mind, they're invariably jumbled up, vague, confused, contradictory, and deficient in many ways. If your goals are just tumbling around in your mind, they offer no clarity, and they give you no motive power. You become like a ship without a rudder, drifting with the tides, crashing into the rocks, and eventually, you'll never realize your full potential. The fourth most common myth is, I don't know how to set goals. Well, no wonder. You can take a master's degree at a leading university, and never receive a single hour of instruction on goal setting and goal achieving. But fortunately, setting a goal is a skill, like time management or teaching or selling or managing or even riding a bicycle. Anything else that you'd need to become a highly productive person. And all skills are learnable. This was the great turning point in my life. All essential skills are learnable. Everybody who can do it today, at one time, could not do it at all. And what others have learned, you can learn as well. You can learn the skill of goal setting by practice and repetition, until it becomes as easy and as automatic as breathing in and breathing out. And from the very first day that you begin setting goals, the progress you will make and the successes you'll enjoy will absolutely astonish you. Now the final myth that people use not to set goals is, goals don't work, life is too unpredictable. Well, here's an analogy. When a plane takes off for a distant city, it will be off course 99% of the time. The complexity of the avionics and the skill of the pilots are focused on continual course corrections. Now, it's the same in life. But when you have a clear long-term goal with specific plans to achieve it, you may have to change course many times, and you will. But you will eventually arrive at your destination of health and wealth and great success. You have two choices in life. You can either work on your own goals, or you can work for someone else and work on achieving their goals. When you learn how to set goals for yourself, you take complete control of your life and jump to the front of the line in your potential for great achievement. Any road will get you there. And as Wayne Gretzky said, you miss every shot you don't take. The very act of taking the time to decide what you really want in each area of your life can change your life completely. The 3% factor. It seems that only 3% of adults have written goals and plans, 
and this 3% earn more than all of the other 97% put together. Why is this? The simplest answer is that if you have a clear goal and a plan to achieve it, you therefore have a track to run on every single day. Instead of being sidetracked by distractions and diversions, getting lost or going astray, more and more of your time is focused in a straight line from where you are to where you want to go. This is why people with goals accomplish so much more than people without them. The tragedy is that most people think that they already have goals, but what they really have are hopes and wishes. However, Hope is not a strategy for success, and a wish has been defined as a goal with no energy behind it. Goals that are not written down and developed into plans are like bullets without powder in the cartridge. People with unwritten goals go through life shooting blanks because they think they already have goals. They never engage in the hard, disciplined effort of goal setting, and this is the master skill of success. In 2006, USA Today reported a study in which researchers selected a large number of people who had made New Year's resolutions. They then divided these people into two categories. Those who had set New Year's resolutions and written them down, and those who had set New Year's resolutions but had not written them down. Twelve months later, they followed up on the respondents in this study, and what they found was astonishing. Of the people who had set New Year's resolutions but had not written them down, only 4% had actually followed through on their resolutions. But among the group who had written down their New Year's resolutions, an exercise requiring only a couple of minutes, 44% had followed through on them. This is a difference of more than 1100% in success, and it was achieved by the simple act of crystallizing the resolutions on paper. The Discipline of Writing In my experience working with several million people over the past 25 years, the disciplined act of writing out goals, making plans for accomplishing them, and then working on those goals daily, increases the likelihood of achieving your goals by 10 times, or 1000%. This doesn't mean that writing out your goals guarantees success, but rather only that it increases the probability of success by 10 times. These are very good odds to have working in your favor, especially when there is no cost or risk involved in putting pen to paper, just a little time. Writing is called a psycho-neuromotor activity. The act of writing forces you to think and concentrate. It forces you to choose what is more important to you and your future. As a result, when you write down a goal, you impress it into your subconscious mind, which then goes to work 24 hours a day to bring your goal to reality. Sometimes I tell my seminar audiences, only 3% of adults have written goals, and everyone else works for those people. In life, you either work to achieve your own goals, or you work to achieve the goals of someone else. Which is it going to be? Success versus Failure Mechanisms Your brain has both a success mechanism and a failure mechanism. The failure mechanism is the temptation to follow the undisciplined path of least resistance, to do what is fun and easy, rather than what is hard and necessary. Your failure mechanism operates automatically throughout your life, which is the major reason why most people fail to fulfill their individual potentials. While your failure mechanism functions automatically, your success mechanism is triggered by a goal. When you decide on a goal, you override your failure mechanism and can help you change the direction of your life. You go from being a ship without a rudder, drifting with the tide, to being a ship with a rudder, a compass, and a clear destination, sailing in a straight direction toward your goal. The Power of Goals A client of mine recently told me an interesting story. He said that he had attended one of my seminars in 1994, where I spoke about the importance of writing down goals and making plans for accomplishing them. At that time he was 35 years old, selling cars for a dealership in Nashville, and earning about $50,000 a year. He told me that that day changed his life. He began writing out his goals and plans and working on them daily. Twelve years later, he was earning more than $1 million a year, and was the president of a fast-growing company that sells services to some of the biggest companies in the country. He told me that he could not imagine what his life would have been like if he had not taken out a piece of paper and written down the goals he wanted to achieve in the years ahead. Take control of your life. Aristotle wrote that human beings are teleological organisms, which simply means that we are purpose-driven. Therefore, you only feel happy and in control of your life when you have a clear goal that you are working toward each day. This also means that this ability to become a lifelong goal-setter is one of the most important disciplines you will ever develop. In nature, the homing pigeon is a remarkable bird. It has an uncanny instinct that enables it to fly back to its home roost, no matter how far away it starts or in what direction it must go. 
You can take a homing pigeon out of its roost, put it in a cage, put the cage in a box, cover the box with a blanket, and put the covered box in the back of a pickup truck. You could then drive 1,000 miles in any direction. Open up the truck, take out the box, take off the blanket, open the cage, and throw the homing pigeon up into the air. The homing pigeon will circle three times, get its bearings, and then fly straight back to its home roost. This is the only creature on earth that has this ability, except for human beings, except for you. You also have this remarkable homing ability within your own brain, but with one special difference. The homing pigeon seems to know instinctively exactly where its home roost is located. It then has the ability to fly directly back to that roost. In contrast, when human beings program a goal into their minds, they can then set out without having any idea where they will go or how they will achieve that goal. But by some miracle, they will begin to move unerringly toward that goal, and the goal will begin to move toward them. Still, many people are hesitant to set goals. They say, I want to be financially independent but I have no idea how I'm going to get there. As a result, they don't even set financial success as a goal. But the good news is that you don't need to know how to get there. You just need to be clear about what you want to accomplish, and the goal-striving mechanism in your brain will guide you unerringly to your destination. The 7-Step Method to Achieving Your Goals There are 7 simple steps that you can follow to set and achieve your goals faster. There are more complex and detailed goal-achieving methodologies. But this 7-step method will enable you to accomplish 10 times more than you've ever accomplished before, and you will do so far faster than you can currently imagine. Step 1. Decide exactly what you want. Be specific. If you want to increase your income, decide on a specific amount of money, rather than just to make more money. Step 2. Write it down. A goal that is not in writing is like cigarette smoke. It drifts away and disappears. It is vague and insubstantial. It has no force, effect, or power. But a written goal becomes something that you can see, touch, read, and modify if necessary. Step 3. Set a deadline for your goal. Pick a reasonable time period and write down the date when you want to achieve it. If it's a big enough goal, set a final deadline, and then set sub-deadlines or interim steps between where you are today and where you want to be in the future. The deadline serves as a forcing system in your brain. Just as you often get more done when you're under the pressure of a specific deadline, your subconscious mind works faster and more efficiently when you have decided that you want to achieve a goal by a specific time. The rule is, there are no unrealistic goals. There are only unrealistic deadlines. What do you do if you don't achieve your goal by your deadline? Simply, you set another deadline. A deadline is just an estimate. Sometimes you will achieve your goal before the deadline sometimes at the deadline, and sometimes after the deadline. When you set your goal, it will be within the context of certain external circumstances, but these circumstances may change, causing you to adjust your deadline as well. Be flexible. Step 4. Make a list of everything that you could think of that you could possibly do to achieve your goal. As Henry Ford said, the biggest goal can be accomplished if you just break it down into enough small steps. Make a list of the obstacles and difficulties that you will have to overcome, both external and internal, in order to achieve your goal. Make a list of the additional knowledge and skills that you will require. Make a list of the people whose cooperation and support you will require. Make a list of everything that you can think of that you will have to do, and then add to this list as new tasks and responsibilities occur to you. Keep writing until your list is complete. Step 5. Organize your list by both sequence and priority. A list of activities organized by sequence requires that you decide what you need to do first, second, and later on. A list organized by priority enables you to determine what is more important and what is less important. Step 6. Take action on your plan immediately. Take the first step, then the second step, and the third step. Get going, get busy, move quickly. Don't delay. Remember, procrastination is not only the thief of time, it's the thief of life. The difference between success and failure in life is simply that winners take the first step. They are action-oriented. As they said in Star Trek, they go boldly where no man has ever gone before. Winners are willing to take action with no guarantees of success. Though they're willing to face failure and disappointment, they're always willing to take action as well. 
Step 7. Do something every day that moves you in the direction of your major goal. This is the key step that will guarantee your success. Do something 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Do anything that moves you at least one step closer to the goal that is most important to you at that time. When you do something every day that moves you in the direction of your goal, you develop momentum. This momentum, this sense of forward motion, motivates, inspires, and energizes you. As you develop momentum, you'll find it increasingly easy to take more steps towards your goal. In no time at all, you will have developed the discipline of setting and achieving your goals. It will soon become easy and automatic. You will soon develop a habit and the discipline of working towards your goals all the time. The 10 Goal Exercise This is one of the most powerful goal-achieving methods I have ever discovered. I teach it all over the world, and I practice it myself almost every day. Here's how it works. Take out a clean sheet of paper. At the top of the page, write the word goals and today's date. Then, discipline yourself to write down 10 goals that you'd like to accomplish in the next 12 months. Write down financial, family goals, fitness goals, as well as goals for personal possessions like a house or a car. Don't worry for the moment about how you're going to achieve these goals. Just write them down as quickly as you can. You can write as many as 15 goals if you like, but this exercise requires that you write down a minimum of 10 within 3 to 5 minutes. Select one goal. Once you've written out your 10 goals, imagine for the moment that you can achieve all the goals on your list if you wanted them long enough and hard enough. Also, imagine that you have a magic wand that you can wave that will enable you to achieve any one goal on your list within 24 hours. If you could achieve any one goal on your list within 24 hours, which one would have the greatest positive impact on your life right now? Which one goal would change or improve your life more than anything else? Which one goal, if you were to achieve it, would help you to achieve more of your other goals than anything else? Whatever your answer to this question, put a circle around this goal and then write it at the top of a clean sheet of paper. This goal then becomes your major definite purpose. It becomes your focal point and the organizing principle of your future activities. Make a plan. Once you've written out this goal clearly and specifically and made it measurable, set a deadline on your goal. Your subconscious mind needs a deadline so that it can focus and concentrate all your mental powers on goal attainment. Make a list of everything that you could think of that you could do to achieve your goal. Organize this list by sequence and priority. Select the most important or logical next step in your plan and take action on it immediately. Take the first step. Do something. Do anything. Resolve to work on this goal every single day until it's achieved. From this moment forward, as far as you are concerned, failure is not an option. Once you've decided that this one goal can have the greatest positive impact on your life, and you've set it as your major definite purpose, resolve that you will work towards this goal as hard as you can, as long as you can, and that you will never give up until it's achieved. This decision alone can change your life. Use Mindstorming to get started. Here's another technique that you can use to dramatically increase the likelihood that you will achieve your most important goal. This is the most powerful creative thinking technique I've ever seen. More people have become wealthy using this method than any other way. Take another clean sheet of paper. Write out your major definite purpose, your number one goal, at the top of the page in the form of a question. Then. Discipline yourself to write a minimum of 20 answers to the question. For example, if your goal is to earn a certain amount of money by a certain date, you would write the question, how can I earn this amount of money by this specific date? Then, you would discipline yourself to generate 20 answers to your question. This exercise of mindstorming will activate your mind, unleash your creativity, and give you ideas that you may have never thought of before. The first three to five answers will be easy, the next five will be difficult, and the last 10 answers will be harder than you can imagine, at least the first time you do this exercise. Nonetheless, you must exert your discipline and willpower to persist until you have written down at least 20 answers. Once you've generated 20 answers, look over your list and select one of those answers to take action on immediately. It seems that when you take action on a single idea on your list, it triggers more ideas and motivates you to take action on even more of these answers. The Great Law of Cause and Effect The most important application of the law of cause and effect is that thoughts are causes and conditions are effects. Your thoughts create the conditions of your life. When you change your thinking, you change your life. 
your outer world becomes a mirror image reflection of your inner world. Perhaps the greatest discovery in the history of thought is that you become what you think about most of the time. Moreover, the teacher John Boyle said, whatever you can think about on a continuing basis, you can have. Napoleon Hill, author of the success classic Think and Grow Rich, which was first published in 1937 and is still selling today, said, whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. When you think about your goal continually and work on it every day, more and more of your mental resources will be concentrated on moving you toward that goal and moving your goal toward you. The discipline of daily goal setting will make you a powerful, purposeful, and irresistible person. You'll develop self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-respect. As you feel yourself moving towards your goals faster and faster, you will ultimately become unstoppable. In the next chapter, I'll explain how the use of self-discipline to develop personal excellence is the most powerful step you can take to achieve all your material and emotional goals. You'll have a bit of motivation if you have 5 or 10 reasons. You'll have more motivation if you have 50 reasons for achieving a particular goal. With so much motivation, nothing will be able to stop you. Point number 5. If you don't have a major definite purpose, make it your number one goal to find your major definite purpose. In fact, 95% of the population has no idea what the central purpose of their lives is. So, if you start off without a major definite purpose, don't worry about it. It means that you're exactly the same as everybody else. Set it as your major goal to find it. And keep persisting, keep thinking, keep reflecting, and keep reviewing what it is that could be your major definite purpose. I promise you, you will find it. And when you find it, it's like your whole life goes into overdrive. Make it the most important single goal of your life to find out what it is that you should be doing. Point number six. Make detailed plans to achieve your goals and break your plans down into monthly, weekly, and daily activities. Always define your goals in terms of the activities you will have to engage in to achieve them. Do something extra every day to move you towards your most important goals. Number seven. Remember this. The more you practice setting clear goals, the better you get. When you become an expert at setting goals and making plans, your success is assured. Even if you are a brilliant human being, extremely intelligent, very capable and talented, without a goal, you will not be able to construct a great life. As I said before, you will have to spend the rest of your life working for people who have clear specific goals and clear blueprints. Now, the psychology of goal setting requires clear specific goals, keenly desired, because they give power, purpose, and direction to your life. Thinking about your goals, visualizing them as though they already existed, repeating and reaffirming them to yourself, builds the drive, commitment, and momentum that moves you out of the comfort zone. Here's a good goal for you, or a good affirmation. If you repeat over and over again, I am the best, I am the best, I am the best, and visualize yourself as the very best in your field, when you repeat this over and over again, you set up a field of vibration, and you drive the command down into the subconscious mind. And as you know, the subconscious then goes to work to make all of your words and actions and reactions fit a pattern consistent with those intensely desired goals. And once you believe that you are capable of accomplishing them, nothing in the world can stop you. Remember, goal-centered living is a source of energy and enthusiasm. It's not possible to be motivated without goals. And when there's something that you want badly enough, you will have the excitement, the motivation, the enthusiasm, and the energy that will drive you towards accomplishing it. Every step you take towards your goal gives you a feeling of accomplishment, that winning feeling that boosts your self-esteem and improves your performance. Each time your self-esteem goes up and you like yourself better, you feel energy and enthusiasm that causes you to try more things, to try other things, to hurl yourself into achieving more of the goals that are possible for you. Goals are the fuel in the furnace of achievement. The more goals you have, the more excited you are about life, the more progress you make. In my estimation, 80 to 90% of the people who are in hospitals and clinics in America are there because they have no sense of meaning and purpose in life. In my estimation, most of the unhappiness in our society comes from people who do not know where they're going. And because they lack that sense of inner worth, that sense of central purpose, they become angry and frustrated and alienated and hostile, and they take it out in drugs and alcohol and negativity, and so on and so on. As soon as you begin setting worthwhile goals and working toward them, you feel positive, 
happy, and in control of your life. We know that we only feel positive about ourselves to the degree to which we feel we are in control of our own lives, and that we feel negative about ourselves to the degree to which we feel we are out of control. The fact that your conscious mind can only hold one thought at a time, positive or negative, and if you think about your goals, you can't think about something negative simultaneously, because it's pretty hard to worry when you're busy working towards something that's important to you. Remember, it takes mental effort and self-discipline to keep your mind on your goals. But if you force yourself to think only about what you want for just 21 days, the same period of time that it takes for a chicken to hatch an egg, if you force yourself to think about it for only 21 days, you will lay down a new positive habit pattern that will stay with you throughout the rest of your life. Well, what have we learned? Number one, and we've beaten this to death. Setting clear specific goals, writing them down, and making step-by-step -step plans for their accomplishment is essential to your success. This is hard work, which is why losers don't do it. Instead, they drift aimlessly, confused, and unhappy. You must discipline yourself to be intensely goal-oriented if you want to be successful. Success is tons of discipline. Number 2. Decisiveness Deciding exactly what it is you want in life is the starting point of all achievement. The positive habit of decisiveness gives courage, clarity, and force to your personality. Number 3. Self-esteem the key to success and peak performance comes from setting goals consistent with your values, that winning feeling which comes from making measurable progress towards goals that are important to you. Number 4. Your subconscious mind is activated by goals in the form of clear mental pictures and positive affirmations. Visualize your ideal goal, complete in every detail. See it as though it existed already. Speak about your goal to yourself in positive, affirmative language. I earn $30,000 per annum. I can do it. I feel terrific. I am excellent at my work. Say this over and over again. Number 5. Read and review your goals and plans every day. Take 30 minutes each day to think and reflect upon your goals, always seeking newer, better, more creative ways of achieving them. In fact, you will find that the 30 minutes that you take at the beginning of each day to think about your goals, to reflect on what you're doing and how you could do it better, to revise your goals to fit in with new information, will be the most valuable 30 minutes that you ever spend. All great achievers in almost all the biographies and autobiographies you'll ever read, you'll find that people begin to become great when they begin to spend time by themselves each day thinking about who they are. Remember, nothing succeeds like success. We all have fears of failure. We're all afraid of risk. We're all afraid of loss. But we have to make a habit of confronting those fears of failure and moving forward. That is why successful people are those who make a habit of success. They start from the same background of limitation and underachievement that everybody else starts from. But then they make a habit of succeeding. This is the key. Learn to succeed by succeeding and laying down a habit of success, which can only be accomplished by achieving challenging, worthwhile goals. Remember, write your goals down. Organize them in order of priority. Select your major definite purpose. Make a plan for its accomplishment. Define the plan in terms of activities, then get to work. Write today, and do something extra every day to move you towards your goal. And your success is virtually assured. Well, there's been a lot of recent research on the qualities of successful entrepreneurs. The primary quality, according to 85% of successful entrepreneurs, is hard work. They attribute their success to their dedication and effort. The second quality is self-discipline. As successful entrepreneurs are able to focus and discipline themselves to tackle their most important tasks consistently. The third quality is persistence, which involves overcoming obstacles, setbacks, and failures. If we consider these three qualities collectively, they account for about 90% of success. Hard work, self-discipline, and persistence are the cornerstones of achievement in entrepreneurship. Now, the starting point for success is to plan each day in writing. Without a written plan, navigating through tasks becomes chaotic, akin to driving on a slippery road. Additionally, it's important to recognize that there are only three key activities each day that contribute to 90% of your value. We call these the Big Three. Sometimes I teach it as the Law of Three. There are three activities that account for 90% of everything you do. Everything else accounts for 10% or less. So, you have to ask yourself, what are the three most important things that I do in my work? Then, you have to discipline yourself to start with the most important task, 
and work on it until it is complete. It's a very simple principle, but it is the beginning, middle, and end of success. Decide on your most important task, begin immediately, and work on that task with self-discipline until it is 100% complete. In life, it's a very simple principle, but all success comes from completing tasks, not just working at them. It is only when you complete tasks that you are successful. So, then you have to ask, what are the most important tasks that I should complete every day? Yes, and the rule is, do not check your email before 11 a.m. in the morning. Because if you check your email, and then it will be 5 or 6 more in the evening, and you're still checking your email. So, email should be used very carefully because email is a great danger for distraction, and distraction is the opposite of discipline. So, the way that you control electronic interruptions is you turn them off, your computer, turn them all off, so that you can work on those activities that generate the most revenue. The most important key to success is to start and complete one important task first thing in the morning. If you eat the frog, if you try to do many things, you end up doing nothing. So, you make a list of all your work before you begin, and then you ask if I could only do one thing on this list, which activity is the most important? And then, you do that activity, and only that until it's complete. If you start every day by completing a task, you will double and triple your productivity. Well, that brings us back to our discussion about goal setting. You have to have written goals as well for your life. A recent study comparing rich people and poor people found that 85% of rich people have one big goal that they work on all the time. Only 3% of poor people have goals. So, you have to decide what your biggest goal is. In business, usually, your biggest goal is personal or business income. If that is your biggest goal, then it's clear. Then you say, what are the activities that I do to generate income? And of all of those, right now, which is the most important for generating income? So, entrepreneurs always think in terms of revenue generation and what we call value creation. There's another interesting study that has just come out, a very good study. It says that there are three rules for success in business. Number one, always choose higher quality rather than lower cost. Most companies think the way to sell more is to lower the price, but the true reason for success, and there's years of research on this, is to improve the quality of your product. The second rule is to focus on revenue generation rather than on the costs of your business, rather than on the price that things cost. Focus on revenue generation. And rule number three is that there are no other rules. Two rules. Focus on quality and focus on revenues. You improve the quality of your product. There was a study of the 500 fastest growing companies in the world that came out last year and they found the number one place where they invested was improving the quality of the product. If you had a certain amount of money to invest in your business, it was not on advertising or machinery or computers, but improving the quality. Well, in my estimation, if I am successful, people will listen to me and take actions that are different from before, and they will get better results. So therefore, my job is to study and research, so that I can give people the best ideas that they can use immediately to get better results. And so, I continue to research on every subject, and sometimes I find a new idea that someone has learned that's better than an old idea, so I will change that. The reason people come to a seminar, you always say that a product has two goals. It has a problem to solve or a job to do. So, people hire a speaker to do a job. In other words, like you hire a carpenter or a cleaner or a painter to do a job. Alright? They hire the speaker, or they read the book, or they listen to the audio because they want it to do a job and they're hiring the speaker or audio or book to do a job. So, the question you ask is, what job does this person want me to do for them? Now, it may be entertainment, like going to a movie, maybe socializing, like going to a restaurant. Okay, but what is it? What is the job? And you say, well, people want to increase their sales and profitability in their business. That's very simple. So then, my job is to help them increase their sales and profitability immediately as a result of my seminar. So, some people will do a seminar, and they will spend the entire time telling stories about themselves. Well, that does not do the job. That does not help people increase their sales and profitability. It may be entertaining, but it does not fulfill the commitment. It does not do the job. So, the other question is, what is the problem to be solved? And in all businesses, if we're talking about businesses, the one major problem is low sales. Sales are too low. Alright? So, 
What is the solution to low sales? The solution is high sales. So therefore the problem to be solved is to help people operate their business to increase their sales or to increase their profitability. The whole purpose of a business mission, purpose, goal, strategy, in my estimation, is to help people. It's to help people achieve something or accomplish something that they could not achieve or accomplish without your help. So, that's the why. And for me the why is very simple. When I was young I was poor and I had no education and no money. And then I discovered continuous learning, personal development. I found you can learn anything that you need to learn to be successful in that area. You could learn to do brain surgery if that was important to you. You could learn to repair an expensive automobile. You could learn to prepare a dish in the kitchen. You can learn anything. You can learn all business skills. You can learn all sales skills. When I discovered this I still remember, I couldn't believe it because it meant that my potential was unlimited. And the more you learn, because of the way your brain works, the stronger it becomes. So you can learn more, faster. It's like a muscle. If you make your muscle strong, it becomes stronger. So, I practiced it myself and changed my life within one year. So then I began to tell other people, this is how it works. And they took the ideas, and they changed their lives. And so I began to teach and tell people these ideas. And then I realized I needed to learn more. So I spent thousands of hours reading and studying and going to seminars. I took 4,000 hours at the university to get an MBA degree. I took hundreds of hours of audio programs, maybe thousands, to learn new ideas to help people achieve success faster than they ever would, because I had that experience. I wanted everyone else to have that experience. Even when I'm talking to you now, you can see this is my passion. I want to help people to be successful faster. But what you have to ask is, if you had all the money in the world, if you were rich, but you had to do something, you still had to work, you could not go on vacation, what would you choose to do? What would you like to do if you had all the money? And you ask that question, you think, well, if I had all the money, then I would like to do this. You know, I spoke to one man who became wealthy, and he wanted to build schools in India for poor people. That's what he wanted to do. He's built now 42 schools. I know two close friends of mine who were very successful, and they wanted to build hospitals in Uganda. They saw something on television, and they visited Uganda, and they realized there was a big need. So now, they come back here, and they work, and they raise money, and they go back every year, and they build a new hospital in Uganda. So that's something that pulls you. You want to do it. And so, ask yourself, if I had all the money, what would I want to do? And then, another thing you can ask is, what if you only had five years left to live, or ten years? You say, if I only had a short time left to live, what would I want to leave behind? What would I want people to say about me? Here's a very important story. They studied the 500 owners of the fastest growing businesses in the world. And they asked them, why did you choose this business? And all of them said, I chose this business because I really love the product. I wanted the product for myself, and so I developed it for myself. Like the founder of eBay was looking for a way to sell his candy dispensers. He had a collection and there wasn't anything, so he created a little auction site on the internet at the beginning. And then he found he could sell other things in an auction. They built eBay, one of the most successful companies in the world. But he started it because he wanted it for himself. So, you'll always be successful if you create the product or service because it's something that you want and believe in for yourself. There's a great story. The one company that grew the fastest in this study of fast-growing companies grew 42,000 in one year, in three years. 42,000 percent. That's 4,200 times in three years. Well, what was the product? The product was an iPad that was specially programmed for children to do their homework. And they put the children's programs from television onto the iPad, and they put the homework from the school on the iPad. So if the child did the homework, they could watch a TV program. When they did more homework, they could watch more TV program. So, children became motivated to do their homework, and all their children, this little family, two or three families, got straight A's in school. Grades went straight up. They always did their homework, and always, so the other parents said, Why do your children get such good grades? They said, Because of this little program we developed for our iPad. And they said, Can we have that? They said, Yes. And they began to tell other people. They grew 4200%.
Everybody wanted this iPad program to help their children get good grades at school. You think they solved a problem, they achieved a goal, they fulfilled a need. I read two to three hours each day. I read all the time. Whenever I have more time to read, like for example next week, I will fly to Georgia in southern Russia. All right, the flight will be 15 hours. I will have to sleep of course, but I will probably read eight hours on that flight. I will take books, and I have books on my iPad, and I have magazines, business magazines, and I will read and take out pages and read, so I will get eight or nine or ten hours. And then flying back, I will get another eight or nine or ten hours of reading. But each day, I read at least two hours. Each day, just in the city, a little in the morning, a little in the day, a little in the evening, continually reading. It's very much like eating. You cannot eat, and people think, well, I will wait until the weekend, and then I will read all my books and magazines. No, you have to read a little at a time. And the key to learning, by the way, is very interesting. In music, all the music that you hear is the pauses between the sounds. It's not the notes. It's the pause. So, in learning, it's the pause between taking in the information. If I say to you, the very best way to invest in your business is to improve the quality of your business. Pause. You have to think about that. That is a good idea. That's a very good idea. The second place that you can invest is to improve your marketing quality, and then marketing. And so, in other words, you have to take time to think about what you're learning while you are learning it. Other than that, it's like having a hose with water in your mouth just non-stop. You cannot learn anything unless you slow down, pause, think, digest it. Yes, just like eating a nice dinner, you have to chew and digest and take time. Well, number one is my family. I have four children, and two of them are married. And the others will be married, and they have grandchildren. Five grandchildren. Of course my wife. But my family has always been healthy and happy and has had a good life. So, that to me is more important than everything else. I would say number two, which is way down below, I would like to say that I helped a lot of people to be more successful faster. But probably the third thing is that I would want people to say that Brian Tracy was a good man. That's all. A loyal friend. A person who always tells the truth, who's a loyal friend, who's helpful, who always supports their friends. You can always count or depend upon him for anything. I have like you're here doing an interview. You know that I am very busy. Came out of my studio this morning. I'm going into another meeting very soon. But I have a rule that if with my friends, you're my friend. Whatever you ask, the answer is yes. We respond. It's always yes. Well, if you can imagine the pistons in an engine, all right. They're always going up and down. So, let's say you have an automobile engine with eight pistons. Well, it's the same as your priorities. They're constantly different. They change. One goes up, one goes down, and this happens all the time with your life, with my life. There is no simple explanation. It's always changing, and sometimes every hour. So you have to just keep setting priorities. What is most important? Now for example, when my children would come to speak to me when I was working, I would always stop everything. My wife wants to speak to me. I stop all work because they're more important. And now, my grandchildren come to see me when I'm working. I stop everything to pay attention to my grandchildren. My top priority is always the people in my life. So, whatever is happening, people always go number one. So, my grandchild, daughter, is three. Usually, my grandchildren have very short attention. So it doesn't take very long, only a few minutes two or three minutes, maybe five minutes, and then they want to go and do something else. Well, again, I am working a lot in the subject of business model reinvention, business model innovation. A business model has about 10 different parts, and they're very much like the pistons in an engine. And the most important part of a successful business is happy customers. And so therefore, everything must be secondary to happy customers. So, the primary job of a business is to create new customers, to find new customers, to make more sales. The second job is to make those customers happy. Whatever else is always secondary. So, if you have a customer, the customer is now top priority. Making the customer happy so that the customer returns and buys from you again, that's the most important thing of all. That's the heartbeat. Paperwork, computers, emails are all secondary. The customer comes first. Now how do we know that this is true? It's because all successful companies put the customer first, and unsuccessful companies think the customers are too much trouble, 
or the customer is always asking for too much. And so, they think that their work in their company is important. But the rule is, that there are no results inside the business. There are no results inside the business. All the results are outside the business, with the customers. So, the reason that you plan and strategize and organize, is so that you can focus on the most important things you can do, to make your customers, happy. Everything else is secondary. Some human beings get along well together, and some do not. And this is just a fact of life, just like when a man meets a woman. Sometimes there is a connection, sometimes no connection. It's the same with customers. Sometimes the customer likes you, sometimes the customer is neutral. You cannot change that. So, the key is to create as many opportunities to meet as many new customers as possible. It's like finding someone to marry. You have to talk to a lot of people. The best thing, and I teach an entire seminar program on hiring the best people, but a simple way is to make a list of everything that you would like in the perfect person. Day, and then when you meet people, compare against your ideas. Writing these ideas down will improve your ability to hire good people by two or three or five times better. You make much better choices. You recognize good people in an interview. Just write everything down so you are clear in your mind what you are looking for. First of all, I have a lot of experience with personal assistants, and I was very clear about what I wanted a personal assistant to be able to do, and what previous experience she had. So, when we found this personal assistant, she was perfect. She fit the list based on experience and knowledge. Probably, I don't do that myself. Other people will do that work, and then I will make the final decision. Well, the reason that I became an international speaker was because I had produced several video training programs that I distributed overseas in foreign languages. And as a result, the companies who attended the video training said, we would like to bring him to Germany, and then to Poland, and then to Italy. The second way is that I wrote books. The major reason why I am so popular overseas is because of my books. And I write four books each year. One book I cannot answer because I have 70 books, and you have to ask what subject would be most important for your development. Then you would read my book, The Way to Wealth, which is one of the best books ever done on business success. And it takes you through each step practically of what you need to do to build any business. If you wanted to learn to sell, then you would read one of my books on the psychology of selling or The Art of Closing the Sale. If you want to manage your time better, you'd read one of my time management books. So the question is, when you say, what restaurant should you go to? It depends upon your appetite. Well, tonight I feel like this kind of food. Well, it depends upon the subject that can help you the most at this time. The word entrepreneur more or less means future. Entrepreneurship is dependent on entrepreneurs, and these are people who take risks to create new products, services and businesses, and they determine the whole future of France. And fortunately, entrepreneurship is learnable. You can learn to become an excellent business person, and then you can accomplish any financial goal you can set for yourself. I would say that Jim Rohn is the most helpful professional speaker and seminar leader in the world today. What people say about me is they say that you learn more practical ideas in a seminar with me than with any other speaker in the world. And that has been my goal for many years. And now millions of people say those words. That if you want to learn a lot of good ideas, Brian has more ideas on any subject than anybody else.